Thank you for listening to this resource provided by Westwood Baptist Church. Listen as Pastor Steve Smart brings the message of hope in Jesus Christ. as Andrew said, our text this morning is John chapter 20, verses 18 and 19, but we're going to look at Luke chapter 24, all right, this morning, and that's what we're going to walk through. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, let's turn together to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13. Our text last week focused on the discovery of the empty tomb, and we ended last week with verse 18. It said, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. And then John, John leaves a, about a tw- 10 to 12 hour gap before he tells us in verse 19 that Christ appears before the disciples. So, before we move on to this chapter, in, on with this chapter, chapter 20 in John, I want to pause, as Andrew said, and I want to look at what happens between those verses between verses 18 and 19. Now to do this, we're going to look to this gospel writer, one that we studied a few years ago. Uh, We actually walked through this text, but it was during COVID. And uh, we were meeting for a brief time online, and it was at that point that we walked through this text. So many of us didn't get a chance to study through it together. So significant, though, is what takes place during that time gap between verses 18 and 19 that it really seems necessary for us to to work through it again so that we have a full picture of what exactly took place on the day of the resurrection. In fact, I think by walking through this text and understanding what took place between those verses, it'll help us better understand what takes place from verses 19 forward when Jesus gives them the Great Commission. So, although your bulletin says we're in John chapter 20, we're going to look this morning at the Gospel of Luke chapter 24, and we're going to look together, I think, at what is perhaps the best-known post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. Uh, it, it's, it's the po- one post-resurrection appearance of Jesus that the majority of people will recognize. It occurs between two pilgrims who are traveling back home from their week in Jerusalem after the Passover. Before we look at the text, though, I want to point out two things about this occasion that I think set it apart and make it really unique from all of the other post-resurrection appearances. Number one, the first thing I want to recognize, and before we look into the text, is that it occurs with two men who have no other significant importance than this occasion. In other words, we don't, we don't know anything else about these guys. They have no other, they play no other part in the Gospels. These aren't people who traveled with Jesus. They're not people who played a significant role in his life. It isn't about Peter or the other disciples. It's not about Mary of Magdala or Mary his mother. And neither is it about a converted Pharisee or about someone who was healed during his ministry. It's two men, just like me and you. They're everyday people, just like us. One of which isn't even named. They're just ordinary people. The second thing that I want us to recognize as we read through this text is that it's about an occasion where these two men come face to face with the resurrected Jesus, but they don't recognize him. And they must come to faith, not by some supernatural recognition or some sensational occasion, but rather they must come to faith just like we do, by the preaching of the Word of God as Jesus shares the gospel with them from the Old Testament all the way to his resurrection. So, we've got two ordinary people 
with no seminary degree mentioned, no religious credentials boasted, just two ordinary people who come face to face with a resurrected Christ as he reveals himself in a very personal way and their eyes are opened to who he is and to what he has done through his death on the cross. This is, this is Jesus raised from the grave sharing the good news of the gospel to ordinary, everyday people. And I think these two men represent everyone. Everyone who wants to understand how it is, now listen, how it is that God would take humans who are darkened in their thinking, confused in their understanding, and despairing in their being, and then how it is for them a good person would have to die in order to satisfy God's wrath. And they simply can't make sense of it. It's the story of how Jesus is going to come alongside them. He's going to walk with them, illumine them, and then open their eyes to his appearance. Two very ordinary, normal people who want to make sense of why the cross had to happen. This could very easily be a story about any of us. Any of us could put our name in this text. So what we're going to do is walk through this text with these two men and follow along as Jesus shares the gospel with us. So let's look at our text. Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village, Jerusalem. So these two men, and let's make me get the picture. These two men, defeated, confused by what they've just witnessed, are going home. They're going to a village from Jerusalem. And as far as, now listen, as far as they're concerned, you have to put yourself in their place. As far as they're concerned, it was a good three-year run, but now it's over. They're defeated and confused why this man who had done so much good for so many people, they're confused about why he had to die. So they're going to go home. They've given up on Christianity because a dead Messiah means nothing. The party's over. Now the word for dis let's pause. the word for discussing here is more than just a dialogue. They were trying to figure it all out. In other words, they weren't just having a casual conversation. They were going back and forth, trying to make sense with it, recalling all the things that they'd experienced, seeing him up on the cross, hearing about all the the the, the, the accusations and all of that, so that they could see all that was taking so that they could see all that was taking place. All they saw were the facts as they were presented, and it just didn't make sense to them. So they're debating with each other, they're trying to make sense of it all. They're going back and forth with each other trying to make sense of how a man they believed to be the Messiah in whom they could see no sin, a man that God loved, a man that people loved, and yet God and yet God let him die. And they're just trying to connect the dots. It just doesn't make And he definitely I mean if we're all, he definitely looked like the Messiah yet from one evening to the next morning he's hanging on a cross of God it just doesn't make sense so they're going back and forth trying to exchange and debate what's happening it says in verse 15 Jesus himself drew near and went with them verse 16 but their eyes were kept from recognizing him he knows them right but they don't know him Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3 verse 10 he says no one is righteous not one now listen no one understands, and here's the kicker, no one's seeking for God. You may have heard somebody say, when I found God, you ever heard somebody say, maybe you said that before? Let me bust your bubble here. God was never lost. You were lost. We don't find God. He finds us. That's why Paul wrote to the Galatians, but when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me, Jesus drew near. He approached them. And that's when salvation begins. When God who chose you and called you is pleased to reveal his son to you. And then Luke says, their eyes were kept from recognizing. Why don't they recognize him? 
I mean, surely they've seen enough of him, right? It's been a busy week, if nothing else. And surely they've had experience with him before that. Why don't they recognize him? It's because they have 20-20 vision. They're just like me and you. Their eyes are darkened. The idea of a resurrection is beyond their ability to understand. Because listen, dead people don't live. I mean, that's, that's just science, right? So Jesus is going to teach them, not by his appearance, not by some convincing supernatural event, but that they must believe, that the, wor that believe the word that God has already spoken. Verse 17. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? Don't you, I mean, you know, looking back, I mean, you know, we look at it and we get to see 2,000 years ago and we get to see how it happened. We know all the things that took place. But doesn't that sound kind of humorous? You know, you see Jesus as he's walking and it's like he's got this real kind of sarcastic almost kind of, so what is this conversation you guys are talking about? Can you hear him saying that? And they stood still looking sad. The reason they're standing there looking sad is probably because they can't believe that anyone within walking distance of Jerusalem would ask such a ridiculous question. Because apparently everybody's talking about it. Verse 18, then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you, and again you have to hear a sarcastic response, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? Now picture it. They look right, now you got to think about it, they look right into the face of the very one that they're discussing. The very one whose death they're trying to make sense of, the very one whose death has caused them such distress and confusion, they're looking right in his face, but they don't recognize him. So again, with apparent what sounds like sarcasm to me, Cleopas essentially says to them, dude, are you clueless? I mean, what, 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 do, you, do you not know anything? The irony of that is that he is the only one who isn't clueless. It's the rest of the world that's clueless. And don't you love Jesus' response? Look, verse 19, he said to them, what things? And they said to him, and now try to picture, you gotta, again, you've got to kind of picture it in your mind, try to picture a smug expression concerning Jesus of Nazareth. A man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and rulers just delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it's now the third day since these things have happened. And then at the end of that, you kind of got to go. Psh! It's like, are you kidding? This guy, this is the one we're talking about right here. In other words, we thought this was the guy. Then our own people killed him. They saw Jesus as the one who was going to free God's people from the oppression of those pagan Romans. And then they add something very significant, verse 22. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they didn't find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women said, but him they didn't see. Now notice here they've been alerted to the facts. Now I want to, I want to remind you, they're confused, they're distressed. They have no clue about the resurrection, and yet they've got access to all the facts. They've been made aware of the empty tomb. They've heard about the angelic visions, but no Jesus. Now remember, they're looking right at him, right? But their eyes are still operating at a 20-20. And the facts are just not adding up. And it all really just seems like an irrational equation. They have the A and the B, but they can't figure out how that equals the square root of C. Verse 25. So he says to them, Oh, foolish ones. Why are they so foolish? Why would he call them foolish? Because they said God was wrong and Jesus was clueless. That's why they're foolish. One scholar said it would be better translated, Oh, stupid ones. Jesus says, oh, foolish ones, 
slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. In other words, the problem's you. This is nothing new. The prophets have been telling you this would happen for centuries. The problem of our darkness. Now listen, the problem of our, our darkness is not that God withholds his glorious truth. The problem is us. And the answer has just been given. Verse 26, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? But for these men and so many like him, it's become like a riddle. And they're confused by it. How can death bring life? Verse 27. So beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them. Now look, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You know, when we share the gospel, we, we give it in four things, right? We start out with God's a holy and righteous creator. Man has sinned against God's will and rebelled and followed his own way and brought upon himself the due penalty of his sin. But Jesus is a merciful redeemer and we must all repent and come to faith and trust him as our Lord and Savior. I think that's exactly where Jesus started. God is a holy and righteous creator. I think he went all the way back to Genesis 1. All the way back to creation. And then he just kept going. Because the entire Old Testament speaks of Jesus Christ. The flood, think about it. The flood in the ark, the Passover in the Red Sea. Both speak of how Jesus is the deliverer of those who trust him. The wilderness and the promised land speak of how he sustains us and he brings us into the hope of our rest. The exile, the return to Israel, how the people face times of both war and peace kingdom and kings, all of that reveals his providential care and his provision in a fallen world desperate for his presence. The prophets, the priests, the temple, its sacrifices, its rituals all show us what Christ must do in order to rescue us from our fallen condition. The songs of lament the psalms of rejoicing give witness to the gravity of Christ's suffering and the glory that achieves. And then you think about the lives of the faithful sufferers, Joseph, Ruth, Moses, and the blood of the righteous martyrs such as the prophets all give weight to the testimony of faith in the coming deliverance of God's people by the Christ. You see, the Old Testament is saturated with Jesus throughout. Now these two men are given the unique privilege of listening to Jesus himself reveal it to them. And he shows how Moses was a mediator, and so Christ is. He shows how the prophets spoke of that mediator, and so Christ is. Verse 28, so they drew near to the village as they were, to which they were going, and he acted as if he were going to go farther. Notice he doesn't force himself on them. Verse 29, but they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. Now, they still don't recognize him, right? How envious can, must we be of this experience these people are having? To have Jesus himself instruct us. I, I, now, I want you to just try to picture it, to listen to his voice unfold for us the eternal plan of God's provision. And the whole time, they have no idea it's him. Then, just like he did for the disciples in the upper room of the Passover meal, verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and he blessed and broke it and he gave it to them. Verse 31, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. Now it all makes sense. As the bread is broken, so was Jesus. As the cup was poured, so the life of Jesus was poured out unto death. And all the prophets had been preparing us for his coming. Just like Joseph was sold into slavery to become a provider. Just as Moses was exiled to be a deliverer. Just as Boaz was a redeemer. So is this man who has walked with them. Jesus. 
provider, deliverer, redeemer. And now their blindness is healed. Jesus, the Christ, is revealed to them. And their faith begin. Listen, these men are eternally born again. Isn't that beautiful? Verse 32, so they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while, we talked to, while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? You see, friends, that's exactly how we feel when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. There we stand. Looking at God, thinking we know all there is that we can know of him. And he finds us. Standing there, perplexed about life, confused about why things don't add up. And then he opens up our ears to hear the truth of his word. He opens up our minds to understand it as truth. And our hearts begin to burn because we finally see the depth of his love and the mercy of his grace. Grace that reaches into the depths of our sin and pulls us out of the cold darkness into the warm light of his love. And just like these two men, our hearts burn within us. Paul said in Romans chapter 5, For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we're recognized shall we be saved by his life. You see, Jesus just shared the gospel. These men are now saved, and now they become witnesses of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 33. And they rose that same hour, And they returned to Jerusalem. Now, by this time, the sun set. It's been a long journey. It would have been a dangerous trip back to Jerusalem on the roads. The journey back to Jerusalem would have taken them about two hours. But they are so excited that Jesus was alive that they had to make the journey so that they could share the good news with others. Verse 33 goes on, it says, And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he's appeared to Simon. Now, in a very short time out of time, the apostles had also come to see Jesus, and they also came to believe in the truth of Jesus' resurrection. And then verse 35, Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And that brings us back to John chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked, and the disciples disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and he stood among them and he said to them, Peace be with you. And that's where we'll pick up next week. So what do we do with our text this morning? Just as we could identify... With Mary Magdalene last week, we can certainly see ourselves in these men as well. If for no other reason, now listen, if for no other reason than to identify with their confusion and pain. We've all gone through difficult experiences. We sat, we came up yesterday and said goodbye to Lake Jones and I thought about Judy and how they're 64 years of marriage and their two daughters and their grandchildren. Yeah, they had eight great-grandchildren. And they all said wonderful things. You know, you expect, I think the thing about funerals, everybody, we all get saved by, you know, dying, I guess. Everybody goes to heaven when at a funeral. Lake Jones was as faithful a man as I'd ever met. His, the joy of his salvation was more evident than anybody I've ever known. And as I listened to his grandchildren, Mitch and uh, Trey and and, uh, Liz, come and share about him, I thought, man, they just, you know, they said the same things over and over and over and over and over again. All three of them, just it was like a record replay in itself. Because Lake lived such a consistent life of faithfulness and joy in Christ. 
And then Scott Peterson got up and he shared as his uh, Sunday school teacher and shared kind of the dynamics and the relationship there. And, and it was, again, it was like a, a, a broken record. Just the same thing over and over and over and over again. But you know, the one thing, even as I listened to the joy that was being said and the, the good things about Lake, I thought about, I thought about the grief that they must be feeling and the sorrow of the loss. You know, we all go through various seasons of loss. Some of you have lost loved ones recently. Some of you are going through illnesses. Uh, I think about Tanya Gums going through some things and, and uh, others in our church family going have got, gotten bad news this week. And we all go through seasons of distress and pain. And just like these men, we're all on a journey. We're all going through this journey together, and that journey sometimes takes us through circumstances that can be painful, even leading us into despair when our expectations are disappointed by tragedy or by sorrow. That's when we can be assured that every trial is an opportunity to discover what God wants us to see. So like these two on the road to Emmaus, we have to trust him to open our eyes. So what do we do in the meantime? Let me give you four good suggestions about how we need to be walking the journey as Jesus walks with us. Number one, real simple. Now these aren't earth shattering. You're not going to walk out here and say, I never even thought about that. You're going to say, oh, I could have done that. Very simple things. Number one, pray. And trust God for the outcome. That's the kicker. That's the hard one, right? Praying's easy. We can all pray. Pray and trust God for the outcome. Listen, you may know exactly what you want, exactly how you want your prayers answered. And listen, it may be honorable and it may be good, but if it's to accomplish what you want instead of God's will, listen, you will live in a perpetual state of disappointment. Those followers of Christ would never have chosen the path of the cross. But they were overjoyed with the outcome of the resurrection. So pray. And as you do, surrender, now listen, surrender your expectations of how you think things should be. And instead, ask God to accomplish his will in whatever way he wills and wants it to be in whatever time that he considers appropriate. Pray and trust God for the outcome. Number two, read the Bible. See, you could have predicted that, couldn't you? Regularly. Read the Bible regularly. You see, that's the only way that you're going to discover God's perspective, by reading his word regularly. Think about it. These men were debating their ideas as they're traveling along that road to Emmaus, they're debating their ideas, they're coming up with solutions, they've got their perspectives, they're agreeing with one another. Yeah, that's right, I thought that too. But they're just trying to make sense of it all on their own. But then Jesus explained the scriptures. And as he did, he helped these two disciples see their circumstances, not from their perspective, but from God's perspective rather than their own. You know, every one of us has access to God's perspective on everything. Do you know that? It's when we read the only completely reliable source of truth, the Bible. Not just a verse here and a verse there. See, that's how I think some of us read the Bible. Well, let's see what God's got for me today. Oh, yeah, there's a good one. Not just your favorite author's devotional bestseller. You see, we discover and learn God's ways when we read his book. All 66 books contained in it. 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. And listen, there is no reason to make that complicated. I just don't know how to read the Bible. 
I get started, and then I get into Numbers and Leviticus, and it just, I get lost. Let me make it real easy for you. Set aside 10 minutes every day and read it. Start with the Gospel of John. Then go to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Then when you finish those, stay with the J's and go to James. And by then, you'll be ready to jump into the Old Testament. And your mind will have a better understanding of who God is and what exactly his will is for your life. Number three, trust that God's timing is always on time. Now remember, God kept these two men from recognizing Jesus until the time was just right. But notice, he didn't allow them to suffer in grief a moment longer than was necessary. See, I think sometimes we think God's just sitting up there waiting so that he can see us suffer. But God didn't make them suffer a moment longer than was necessary. Neither did he comfort them too soon. You see, if you're a child of God, friend, listen, you're on a journey, just like these travelers on the way to Emmaus. You may go through seasons when you feel all alone. You may go through seasons where you're disappointed by circumstances and loss. But journeys take time. So stop rushing the process and trust God's timing. He's at work. He's always faithful. Number four. Pray and ask God to be the Lord of your life. Notice that Cleopas and his companion listened intently to Jesus as he spoke to them. And then, now listen, then they invited him into their home. So hear me when I say this. If you're out of fellowship with God, or if you've never truly come into a relationship with him, you're going to continue to struggle with doubt and confusion. That's a promise. You'll have your high moments. you have your moments of joy and things will be good and the world will make sense again, but they'll always be derailed by some kind of pain, some kind of disillusionment. So let me tell you what the Word of God says. John said this in his first letter. He said, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, then he's faithful and just to forgive our sins. And cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Friend, very simple put. If you've never truly trusted Christ to be the Lord of your life, start there. Start there. If you know Christ, then walk secure and safe in the blessing of his providence. Knowing that he will continue to be faithful. And the plan that he had for you yesterday... It's the same plan he has today, and it will be for eternity. And you can trust that. And it will not change. But if you don't know him, you don't have that certainty. So trust him today. Accept him by faith. And let's start the journey together. Amen? And then Jesus will say to us, peace, peace, shalom. Let's pray again. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the goodness of your mercy that you've shown to us. Thank you, Father, for your patience with us, for the process that all of us go through, knowing that we all come to the cross through a different path, through different circumstances, but we all must arrive at the same place. So, Father, we know and acknowledge that that place is the cross of Jesus Christ. And it's upon the cross that we see Jesus raised, lifted up, dying on our behalf that he might bear the guilt and the weight of our sin so that we would not have to answer for it. Thank you, Father, for the process of exposing and revealing this to us. Father, I pray for those who know you, who have trusted you. I pray that this would strengthen our faith encourage us to go and do likewise, to share this this faith with those who are in need, to be encouraged in it despite our circumstances and despite our loss and disappointments, and help us, Lord, to know the joy of our salvation. For those who are far from you this morning, 
who are still doubting, still confused, still trying to walk their own path. Father, I pray that you would draw them close to you. Reveal to them how it is that we've fallen away from you and brought upon ourselves such trouble and hardship and ultimately eternal demise. And then draw them, I pray, by your mercy and show them that your grace is greater. Draw them to repentance, I pray. Father, if there are some here this morning who are those who trust you, believe in you, but they're kicking at the goad, struggling against your will for their life. They're making decisions that are in accordance with what they think are right and what you say is right. Father, I pray that you would draw them to the truth. I pray you bring people into their life that are going to speak truth to them. I pray you would silence the voices of those who encourage them to continue to the wayward path. I pray, Father, that you place their foot back on the right path. Let us all, I pray, live lives that please and honor you. We pray this for your sake and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And listen, before Matt comes up, I mean, come on, Matt, you're good. We'll make you wait. Before he comes up, I just want to tell you, listen, if you need prayer, if you want someone to talk to, if you want to continue the conversation of what it means to know Christ, Maybe you just need somebody to pray with you. Maybe, you, maybe you're one who's going through some, some time here, some, some trials, some disappointments, and you just don't, you don't have peace. Can we pray for you? We've got a little section of our building just over here at the corner. We walk out these doors called the Starting Point Yes, It's right by the coffee bar. There'll be pastors over there and other ministry leaders. We just want to pray with you. We're here. We want to share with you the good news of Christ help you find the answers that you need and we want to help you in your Christian life. Don't leave. Don't rush off. Fellowship. Enjoy each other's company when we dismiss. We'll make you wait a little bit. We'll be there. We'd love to see you. Amen. Thank you for listening to this resource provided by Westwood Baptist Church. While we are so glad you were able to listen, we encourage you not to allow this to take the place of you attending a local church. If you would like more info on Westwood, follow us on social media at Westwood Life or visit us online at westwoodlife.org.